I hope now that the audience is really sort of preparing good questions and I will soon let you ask questions to all these brilliant ladies and gentlemen. But first I will actually give you an opportunity to ask questions to each other. You've been sitting here for a long time listening to each other. I bet you have interesting questions. Svante, you, you, yes. you're one of the organizers, you will have to start this. I can start with a question. Uh, and. Um we have heard many good things today, uh, and my, my question is, of course, it looks very easy, it looks uh, profitable, it looks good for the environment, for the whole society. Uh, so the question is, why don't we do this? What, what, which are the real obstacles? Uh, and, and my second question is, perhaps, and try to answer that question myself, <laughs> is uh, how is it that we, we make this it's too easy? Uh, People don't earn so much money if we go in this direction. Uh, people uh, could accept, uh, for example, Bill Gates, he get more money if we take another direction. Uh, can we make this easy way more profitable for more people so they love this strategy? Yeah, I mean, business can be really powerful. If they yeah. want to change, they can really bring about the change. So but can it's, we make it's so few actors who can get profit yeah. from this very easy a good system. Could that be a problem? That was it's a too easy. To everybody. Do, do you want to post your question to any particular or to all of them? Yes, I start with the last one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that people will soon start to rebel. I mean, I mean here, I mean the citizens because of the high costs of uh, these externalities. Because governments, you know, are, are being stuck with the bills of everything. Which so on the one hand, the profit gets privatized, as we heard many times already now, and the, the costs get sort of socialized. And, you know, with, with, uh, in the world now, the Gini coefficient, which sort of looks at, you know, how many rich people and poor people we have, is going in the wrong direction, right? So eventually, I think that string will, will, will break. And I just hope that we start to do things before, you know, basically things fall apart. But again, it's just a matter of, of people being tired and fed up sooner or later with this. And you can see already some trends. I mean, just the fact that uh, there are a lot of consumers who go and buy organic or from, at the farm directly. Um, they're very concerned about their health. Uh, like the U.S., for example, I can tell you, the U.S. Is now, has, in two years in a row, dropped the meat consumption by almost 10%. So it's actually, Europe, the no, U.S. is going down. Europe is still going up. In Germany, I think it's the worst there are there in Europe in terms of meat consumption or increasing still. And also actually doing it the wrong way. Never mind not eating it, but doing it the wrong way. So I think the trend is there in some places, and I think it will continue. Okay, thanks. Hans, do you have a question to anybody of the other speakers? Well, maybe I would like to ask um, the scientist. So, so how, how, what do you do to try to make sure that your science actually goes out there? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> yes. uh, the, the most of the research that I do is participatory research. I do research together with farmers. So this agroforestry project that I told you about is a, uh, um, participatory uh, project. So we work together, researchers and farmers, to do research and develop the systems at the same time. And that is so interesting because then you, then you learn so much and the, the problems and the questions are really relevant. And also we make change by doing it. So that is one thing. The other thing is that I'm, I'm out speaking with customers and people so much that I can. And that is problematic because it doesn't make my, my position at the university very safe. <laughs> <laughs> that is the problem. Okay, because, well. <laughs> yeah. But I think you have to do it because now when the, when the situation is so acute, the researchers has another responsibility and all, all, all people have different responsibility now because we have to help each other too, to, make, to, to find good solutions and we have to use our, our experience and knowledge to do that. So it's important. So I follow up on that. Yeah, is it difficult for you to, to get money uh, for that type of, of uh, work? Uh, is it difficult to, to be published if you work close to the farmers? So it's very yes, and it's even it's more and more difficult, I think, because the system is um, more uh, focused on uh, publishing papers and counting papers. Mm. So you take a small piece of the of the research and, and 
and do things that you're really sure about the, what you, the answer you will get, and then you get more publication, and then you get more funding. Yes. And this kind of research doesn't produce so much papers because it takes a long time, and it's complex, and you have to develop new methods. So yes, we will need more uh, resources to do that. This. So, a comment? Yeah, 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 yeah. actually, yeah. because I think one thing is important here is that agricultural research belongs into the public domain. And it's not something because food security is a human right. Mm -hmm. And so, so how can, can government continue to delegate to the private sector the research in agriculture? So actually what they need to do, they need to give enough money to universities so that you don't spend half your time mm -hmm. or in people in research institutions writing grant proposals. I mean, there has to be sort of a competitive system. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think it went way overboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I guess, Sue, so do you have a question to the others? Have you been wondering uh, anything in particular? No, actually, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, actually, it's not that easy. Um, the the type of agriculture that we uh, that uh, we've been proposing actually is not that easy to do be, um, because of what you said about the reductionist mindset. You see, it's uh, much more difficult to put facts and figures on table uh, 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 on the ground. We just took one thing, which is compost and yields, and, and uh, uh, which um, most agricultural research is very linear. It's not multidimensional. And I can tell us, because Johanna was our lead, with the study we did in the three, and I don't know whether we still have our paper in to accept it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, people, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, it doesn't, we, we're not fitting into yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the um, scientific paradigm that, mm. that has been developed, mm. particularly since the Second World War. Um, uh, you know, it's like everybody thought that the, uh, Organic system was old ladies with bed socks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? And there's still this attitude. You're not, yeah. sm you're not smart. You're not. Um, now, I think there are technologies available for us to do very good research. Mm. But nobody wants us to ca come up with uh, these complex answers. Uh, we, when we started this, the, you, you didn't have computer systems, etc. Now there are computer systems. In social science, you can do fantastic stuff. But when it comes to agricultural science, they, um, it's very difficult. I, I, I remember with our um, big database that I, I, I pulled that graph from, it took me three years. Well, actually, then I got money from FAO. But I couldn't even get my colleagues in Ethiopia interested in doing the analysis. I'm not a statistician. and um, Anyway, it's very good to pass something over to somebody else and test it against you. Yeah. So you see, I think that, that they're... Um, also, it's not glamorous. You, you know, we, you don't put on a white coat and sit in a lab and draw nice diagrams on a... Yeah. Yeah. So, so the world, world is complex, but people don't want complex answers. No. And also, it goes back to what you talked about, Hans, about the peer review process. We yeah. have really mm. bad peer reviewed papers, and <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> I mean, outside, outside science, there's a lot of good things happening as well, but it's not sort of suitable in the peer review process. So, okay. Chito and Andrea, do you would, anything I, particular you want to raise like to, to the others? To the people, to the questions of the people. Oh, yeah. You have something? Yeah, I would like to ask uh, Hans about uh, what could be the practical uh, steps that we can do now, uh, doable and practical, with respect to the uh, continuity of uh, advocating for the findings of the ESTD. You mentioned about the CFS, but uh, that may not be enough. And uh, uh, what can be done uh, some more so that uh, we can really uh, advocate these uh, meaningful changes? Because uh, we have experienced in the past that even the FAO 
uh, after the uh, release of the ESTD report, then they attempted to make another conference, to make another blueprint for agricultural development uh, without mentioning the ESTD report. Only, uh, but uh, when we, uh, some of the uh, uh, people in, uh, involved in the ESTD, uh, Andre and myself signed the, with the groups, uh, of course, uh, Hans was the uh, co-chair of that uh, exercise, and uh, then only then that uh, it was mentioned, but still uh, the uh, contents there are not being pushed by uh, through the FAO. So what could be the more practical and doable things to push this, uh, find this more forward in different uh, avenues and different levels? Is it possible to answer short? <laughs> yeah, still, yeah uh, I think it's uh, fairly short. The, uh, the expectation were, were two. One was that actually at the in agency level, FAO and others, they would already inform the government that this uh, report had been done and what were the key findings. But then they were also supposed to do it, that was the FAO, was actually to help the countries to do similar assessment at national level. Because the, it, the agricultural policies are done at national level. They're not done at the regional or even uh, uh, global level. So you need assessment at the country level to understand, okay, what is the problem with that agriculture in that country? What are the issues? And then how to overcome them? Again, in the same style, multi-stakeholder uh, thing. And not one country actually has done one since. And why? It's because FAO actually, has, as uh, Chito just said, they basically put that report under the table. They didn't want to hear about it. And it's very clear why. Because we said that biotechnology basically has nothing to contribute to the key issues in agriculture which we identified. And so because FAO is already undermined by the, the, the business lobby, as we know. Mm. And, and then on the trade, we say every country needs to be able to define its own agricultural policies. And again, that goes against the grain of WTO and the, the major supporter of FAO, US, Australia, Canada. And again, they, they basically blockaded the whole thing. So that's, that's where we stand. Okay. Thanks. And I think now it's really time to open up the floor for questions from you in the audience. So we have microphones, and please speak as close as possible to the microphone so they can hear it on the internet as well, because there are people following this seminar also over the internet. And we also have a hashtag on Twitter, hashtag 100 with numbers, agroeco. So you can actually ask questions over Twitter as well, see if we can pick up one or few from the, the internet audience as well. So, I saw one hand over there. You please go. You're, oh, you first? Okay, you second. <laughs> Does it work? Yes. Well, I'm very interested in urban gardening, guerrilla farming, balcony uh, pig styes. <laughs> uh, that's silly, sorry. But I think a lot of interest for agroforestry and agroecology could be raised through urban farming. Making young people plant their own little potato in a very funny little corner of the garden, uh, finding new spots. We could do it during the war. We can do it now. People will enjoy it. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in Stockholm, and I wonder if any research has been made. Could this kind of agriculture actually yield sufficient food for small suburbs? Okay, Thank thanks. you. And I don't mind who answers, but I would <laughs> like to Ethiopia to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you, Johanna, you also <coughs> mentioned the urban farming. And Sue, do you have an? Is it common? Can take a series of questions? No, we can wait for the. Yeah, we'll okay. Um, actually, with more than 50% of us li are now living in uh, urban environments, we have to take our urban agriculture extremely seriously. Um, uh, but you, what you struck me as uh, um, actually behind most of this problem is the education system. Um, and uh, we, as well as working with farmers, we also work with environment clubs in schools. I think actually um, there's a lot, lot more that we should do to uh, work uh, with the environment clubs. Um, in, in schools. Uh, not everybody wants to grow their own potatoes, no. 
But there are enough people who get quite a kick out of growing uh, and, and uh, harvesting and eating their own food. Um, and I think this is very important. Somebody asked Johanna about pollution from the air. Yeah, but if, uh, if Stockholm can clean its water and clean its air, then the other cities of the world can, uh, are going to be serious about this. Then urban agriculture becomes even safer and better. Our biggest challenge in Ethiopia is access to clean water. Most of the urban agriculture is being done um, with uh, water which is highly contaminated, particularly with human, uh, uh, human waste. So this is, that's the big challenge. Um, actually, for me, one of my big issues is if we're going to get the recycling, which we, uh, the cycling, sorry, back into the systems, that it has to be between the urban and the rural environments because urban environments are highly extractive and they're returning very little to the rural communities. And they don't know what to do with the waste. But they, actually, there are plenty of techn very good technologies. And um, Soil and Moore in, uh, even knows how to decontaminate um, uh, waste from flour from the floricultural industry, where there are pesticides and things. They have systems of compost making, which can decontaminate. Yeah. So it's, we don't, there's no problem if we put our minds to it. We can find the technological solution. The thing is, it, it's, where, it's people who, it's where the, it's in English we say, the piper who calls the tune, you see? If big business is going to, it's going to cough up for this and not for that. And I am very worried about Rio Plus 20. Big business is trying to take out <coughs> too much <coughs> from the zero draft. I'm very, very worried. Well, yeah. So, no, <laughs> I think, I think, no, actually, I'm more worried about the, let me tell this was my concern from Rio Plus 40 here. Um, you've got Olivier de Schutter's um, fantastic studies. Part, uh, which follow on from the ISTAD. Um, and they're uh, being all pushed under the... The UN is being treated like a second-class citizen. And this is a very serious issue. So however passionate governments are going to be in Rio, it's actually the businesses which are going to call the tune. And this it was the challenge when we were doing the GMOs, and it hasn't gone... It, they've got much stronger and they get in on the tables next to the governments as NGOs. Thank you, Sue. You, Sorry, you, you, I'm very passionate about this. We got extremely far away from the question of, that started it all, but it was so exciting, so I didn't want to interrupt you. Sorry. So please pick another question from the audience. <coughs> that one there. That, I saw you as number two and then three. Do you have a microphone? There's one. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Uh, um, many organizations are now talking about uh, food sovereignty instead of food security. Um, uh, and what do you think about that? For example, um, to make sure that countries produce uh, food for their own people before they export. Okay, so let's pick another question and you try to remember and then we will pick your favorite one. Okay, do you remember or do you want to write it down? That's okay. <laughs> Food sovereignty. The gentleman behind you. See, yeah, that works, yeah. Um, Hans said that uh, consumption defines production. And the Johanna gave a beautiful illustration of a very tight little feedback loop where if you put something dangerous into your food and the food goes to the pigs, you risk getting it back again in your meat. Um, it seems to me that if we can, if I can just ask you for a moment to go down from your helicopter view and to look at individual consumers' motivation for change. 
Okay, do we have another one? I'll pick three and then we will... I think you're next, then you're number four. Okay. Uh, yes, my question is uh, regarding this long-term perspective that you all have talked about the need for. And uh, if there, you think there is any uh, aspect of this organic farming uh, and agroecology that also creates uh, possibilities for cooperation between farmers. So they change from uh, yeah, only looking at the business model and going into cooperation with each other with this model to get the long-term perspective. Okay, let's take the fourth then, and then we will hand it over to the panel. Yeah, um, my question is to Johanna, and you said that um, we need to lower our meat consumption both for the environment and for our own health, and I was, this is quite a sensitive issue, so I was wondering how do you see it will be possible? Is it through, through behavioral change and information, or is it through economic incitements like taxes? Thank you. So now, now we have uh, at least one question that is posed to a particular person, Johanna, and we have uh, three other questions that are more open. Anyone wants to start? Andre, do you have a favorite one? Yeah, I think this last one that the... Try to come as close. Yeah, as close that you said about cooperation among farmers. Well, at least in Brazil, what I've been seeing is that main, the, the main change in, in, in food production uh, towards organic or sustainable agriculture came from farmers and basically came um, uh, from this cooperation among farmers. I belong to a network and my organization belongs to a network of more than 5,000 families of small holders in southern Brazil. And this organization, among others in Brazil, has been responsible to promote this change. So yes, it, it, it's happening. Chito, do you have a favorite one? Well, my passion also is uh, related to cooperation because uh, uh, when there is farming by small scale farmers, one way to create market also is when there is cooperation, then they can pull together the products with small individual farmers so that there is volume of products that can be sold into the market. Secondly, for any so-called empowerment and things like that, organizations are, equal, are important, especially in any kind of participatory development. Organization is an important vehicle, really, for the so-called distributive justice of roles as well as responsibilities and benefits. So, Johanna, what about meat consumption? I have plenty of favorite questions among your questions, so I would like to, to inter make them interact. But so, if we take the consumption pat uh, the meat consumption as an example on how individuals motivate themselves or how we motivate individuals to change, I think that of course we need taxes. But I think the problem with taxes is that if you have too much high taxes. Uh, it's uh, not possible because you will not be voted for next elections. So I think that we have to to uh, use people's um, use happiness and pleasure and and um, find out ways to make this food that we have to eat that is sustainable also the good food that tastes good that are cheap and that we like to buy. And uh, because um, I have um, worked in my whole. Um, uh, working life with uh, agriculture and how to uh, develop sustainable agriculture. And I know that we know how to do this, but we don't know how to make people eat what we can produce. And so now I have been starting to do research and, and teach in a, a program that is called Meal Ecology Program. And it's exactly that, the, uh, that thing that you start to think, how can we produce sustainable? And how can we make people eat sustainable? How can we... Um, um, uh, motivate them, how can we interest them, how can this, meat, uh, this food be so, the, the best food, the goodest food. And so we work together with uh, uh, chefs. Chiefs, chefs and people that are really good to, to do good foods. And then I think that is the way forward to, to um, make it tempters, it so, attractive. Um, yeah. yeah, for people interesting. to interesting, yeah. and also, and also, I think that then um, urban agriculture is very important. We, ha we can we can learn a lot from from uh, Addis, for example, this youth group. They are so impressive, and also from, for example, Havana, where 
where people grow 80% of their vegetables and fruits. I think that, that is the, the, the food that is most easily produced in cities. But there is a lot of initiatives in Malmö, in Stockholm, and even in Örebro, where I live, we try to, to establish an agroforestry park together with the community and the university, university. And then we can do research on that, because it's both important for producing a lot of food, but also for changing people's um, habitats so that they eat less meat. So with happiness and pleasure and with good food, and that is the way forward, I think. Svante, do we have a favorite mm. one? Some reactions, yes. Um, I think we have to remember that the price of the meat is, is, uh, is, is subsidies. Uh, I mentioned earlier that 435 billion is going to the agriculture sector. And that means that there is not a correct price on the meat. It will be much higher if we don't have these subsidies. And the other thing that we also have no taxes from the palm oil import or soya import. It's also very unfair. So, I mean, we have subsidies as the first solution to get a more correct price on the meat. The second uh, comment is uh, connected to the cooperation. I mean, that has been a success story for us in the Swedish farmers who have been cooperated. Uh, and I think that has been a very successful story. And I think it's more important than ever compared to Sue Edwards' discussion about the, the power analyze. Uh, the business side is much, much stronger now than in the 1970s. Uh, and I, I discuss very much, and I think very much about if you compare the, the fossil debate, and I see that uh, Petron BP, they can now put more and more money in wind production. They can earn money in a new way. That's, that's an easy way for a transition for that company. But what is the, the, the possibilities for these uh, companies who produce fertilizers or, sub, uh, or uh, uh, chemicals? How can they, they get profit from a new concept? If we don't give them that opportunity, it will be very, very tough to change this economic strong, strong power. So I, we have to, to give them an opportunity in a new direction. And that's also connected to we haven't the knowledge we have the problem in the whole society that we are not seeking in the right direction. So that's also a possibility, it's also a puzzle, a bit of puzzle in, in, the, in this complex situation. As we have to, to really have discussion from the SLU, how are the, the possibilities to, to make a career in that type of university if you're doing a, 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 a scientific career in that direction? I mean, if you can't do that, it's very difficult to get this knowledge. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that's really what I said before. You know, if governments don't start to invest in research, again, in, in, in their own public universities, things will not change, or research organizations. That's where they have to be putting money in order to do this. But maybe the issue on food security and, uh, of, yeah, and uh, sovereignty. You know, when we had, we had several crises, food crises in the past, right? And um, we have a globalized food system. So does it work? Obviously not. And that's why I think countries more and more think, you know, we need not only food security, which is sort of the, the, at the larger scale, but also food sovereignty. And, and, and again, in our report, we, we, we were told, don't use that word, because it's uh, the devil, red flag, nobody will even sign on the report if you use that word. Actually, we define it inside too. We, we get, show the definitions. But it is clear by the fact that when we use, uh, looked at the trade issue, we say country need to be able to decide on their own what their agricultural politics will be. And it is clear that there's not one country in the world who can manage without supporting their farmers. They have to be supported whatever way. There's got many, many different ways you can do that. In my own country, back in Switzerland, what do they do? They pay farmers to use less fertilizer. The more flowers you have in your, in your pasture land, the more money you get. I'm not saying that this is all just perfect, but I think there are ways, actually, to, to help farmers without going into a, a corrupt production system, as we have in, in, in most um, uh, instances. And on the meat thing, just uh, I think you're glad you mentioned the chefs because, and you have a famous chef here, another one guy up there in the, near the, the um, Arctic Circle, who actually he was in Time Magazine recently. And um, so what basically he cooks whatever he gets there. I mean, most of it is shooting meat, I guess, but, uh, uh, but still, that's what they get there. Uh, and he has his little garden, and he, so just to show that it can be done. So again, the chefs, I think, also linking up with schools is a good way. And the other one is there are plenty 
interesting movies out there, you know, which you see some of them, I don't even touch a piece of meat, certainly not a hamburger. <laughs> Thanks. So, more questions from the audience? Uh, now it's getting really tricky to keep track of the order here, but I think perhaps here, and then one, two, <laughs> and then three in the back. Uh, two questions. The first is fairly um, uh, elementary. I mean, uh, it seems like one of the take-home points from, from all of your speeches is that food is too cheap and it should be more expensive. And if anyone sort of does not believe this, then, then, then it, it, that will be... Uh, my, my question would, would then be why. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I suppose this, the second question touches a bit on what, what Hans just said just now about, about uh, food sovereignty. And it's perhaps not one that I particularly like asking, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, it's quite clear from your talks that the global food market, global food trade, is, is it's, uh, highly un unfair regulated. And, and I mean, we, we see, uh, for instance, from, from the instance of Mr. Axelsson's uh, speech that um, the nitrogen juice in, in Europe is very inefficient and it could be used better elsewhere. And this is clearly happening and this is clearly going on because the tables are turned in favor of the European farmer. And if uh, farming was, 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 you know, if barriers were reduced and, and, and it became, you know, a free market system, then clearly European farmers would lose out, right? Because, I mean, Europeans don't particularly like to farm, and I think that, I mean, this is my prejudice, I think it's right. And I think that farmers in Africa are much more keen to do so. Farming in Europe would, would reduce significantly, and we would have farming in countries that are perhaps not as democratic as um, uh, you know, the, 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 you, 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 European countries have to be able to face this at the North South Divide. Another thing I don't particularly like talking about, but you know, there it is. Um, Europe has learned that it's dangerous to rely on outside nations for strategic commodities. I mean, we learned it in 1973 for oil. We learned it now that it is you know, relying on, on Russia for gas. It's not a nice thing to do. And now, basically, we are relying on other countries for. Food. So, so the first question was yeah, rather easy. Okay. Food is too cheap. Why? Okay, what is the, second question? Okay, this is the second question? <laughs> yeah, come on. What do you have to say about this? You just want to like throw that in there and see what kind of comes out. Okay. Next one. <laughs> yep. It's sort of relating to your previous question right there, and what you're all describing sounds like a wonderful, very holistic approach to both sustainability and agriculture, but also to economic and social development. Um, and I'm only, uh, there's sort of this unlucky separation between many different fields within the political sector today. We like to talk about trade very separately from, for example, agriculture. And now that the common agricultural policy is being reformed in 2013, how do you think we should approach our politicians and our decision makers to uh, implement this more holistic approach to agriculture and development? Because um, that really seems to be one of the biggest problems here. So I would just love some input on that one. Thank you. Thanks. And we had one, in, <coughs> last one in the back, and then we will switch to the panel again. Yeah, please. All right. Um, as Ms. Edwards said, your recommendations are not very popular. I mean, they call for uh, complex, systemic, and deep changes the type that are not really popular with governments that are preoccupied with re-election, who prefer perhaps more reactive solutions. And so my question is in, in two parts to uh, Mr. Gonçalves and Mr. Medina. The first way is that how do you make sure that when you work directly with farmers, they know um, that they're part of the solution, that the work they're do doing is intrinsically important? And then uh, to Mr. Heron, how do you make sure that uh, how do you excite people's demand from their governments to adopt more complex solutions that they're not even able to, to artic articulate most of the time? Okay, thanks. So who wants to start? I want to start with her yeah. question. I like very much your question. That's something that, <laughs> that strikes me. Um, and I, th I don't know how to answer. I don't know. First of all, I don't know how to answer a question. Because I think that that's one of our, our main th I would say one of our main failures. It's because I have the feeling that we are always speaking for ourselves. We are speaking about the, the wonderful life of organic agriculture, of sustainable agriculture, but we are only preaching for the converted one. This is very common in Brazil. 
We do a meeting, oh, agroforestry is interesting, agribusiness is bad, blah, 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 and then we don't move. So I don't know. And one of the things that I think that we, we, we have to, to, to do is to be more strategic, mm. to make our, our, our points, to transform it in policies, in, 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 in way of con convincing people. But yes, I do. And one of the things that I have the feeling is that we are really dogmatic in our positions. A, a couple of weeks ago, I visited a farmer. In fact, he's the, 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 the parents of a student of mine. He's not organic. He's not, he, he cultivates tobacco, onions, and, uh, but he's doing a wonderful job in soil management and reducing pesticides and a lot of improvements, environmental improvements in his farm. So I think I'm, I'm really interested in this kind of guy as well. And I think that we, from the organic movement, at least in Brazil, I'm talking about Brazil, we haven't been able to reach these people. People that doesn't want to transform to be part of this church, because it looks like a church sometimes, but That's they want to, I'm sorry to say that, but at least I'm talking about my country. I'm not talking about Sweden or other contexts. So, and that's one of the, our failures. That, and I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't believe that we're going to have uh, a majority of people doing sustainable agriculture, as I believe. But I do believe that we can make a lot of people incorporating um, environmental changes in their way of production. Reducing pesticide, that's something that's, if my boss, if Laercio Herbie speaking about this, he's, but I think that we, we have to start. Like for instance, I, I cannot be naive to think that uh, my country will abolish soybean production or ethanol production. It's, it, it's a very naive position. So I think that we have to start a dialogue uh, with this sort of people. I, I don't know if I, I answer you, but that's my take. Chito, do you have anything to add when it comes to how you approach farmers? I, I would like to look at it in a different way. Uh, simply, uh, the way we do it is uh, the farmers have their own capacity to observe, to generalize. In fact, uh, well, uh, the uh, origins or rudiments of science was observation and generalization, uh, or establishing the cause and effect relationship. And in that case, uh, uh, while the science is needed, uh, even if you leave the farmers, they can observe, they can innovate. And from that uh, framework, then uh, uh, somehow uh, there is still lots of social capital out there in the field by the farmers themselves, for themselves. So our role, perhaps, the scientist role and technologist role is simply to augment and support, of course, to communicate also the findings from other sphere of knowledge generation. But still, uh, going back to the very rudiments of that is the farmers can generate their own uh, technology, improve upon uh, what they have and what we can give them also. In fact, even all the technologies that we provide them, many of them are being adapted, ADA, not ADO, or not O, but A, meaning they get it, but they change it, modify it to suit their own environmental conditions and economic conditions. So in that case, there has to still to be translated into operational and, uh, and practical and uh, useful ways in their own context, environmental, social, economic, as well as cultural preferences. So that's how I look at it. Thanks. So is food too cheap? <laughs> and um, why? <laughs> it, is, it is too cheap, because if, if it weren't too cheap, you wouldn't throw it away. Very simple. I mean, and the, the data are there. You know, the, we actually, in our chapter, in the Ag chapter of the Green Economy Report, we cite there's a lot of references there, and there's new studies going on right now in Europe, again, on this issue of food waste. And it is tremendous. I mean, if you, if, if you think that 30% after you buy it in the supermarket actually is thrown away, mostly the fresh stuff and also meat, because it, it gets green in the fridge, and then what do you do? And why it, it, the supermarkets are the, are the problem? Because they force you, basically, to buy more than you need. Mega packs, save this, save that. You know, it's stupid. And, so, so, and why? It's because they're pushing the price down at the farmer level so they compete with each other. I mean, it, it's a very unhealthy system. And again, we have to figure something to, uh, to do. And as I say, you know, because the food is actually subsidized. And subsidized twice, because not only on the production side, but afterwards, when you consume that stuff, 
uh, too much of it very often, too much processed. You, you have these doctor bills and most, most are carried by yourself and your, your, your friends, taxpayers. So actually, not only on one hand you, pro you, you pay to produce too much and eat too much, but on the other side you have to pay uh, again, the community pays uh, for, for the health uh, issues. But then, you know, the question, okay, how do you excite people or even policymakers to make those changes? And actually, I can tell you from experience now, because if anyone wants to go and knows what we do, uh, the Millennium Institute, we are trying to get governments to look basically at, at the government and what they do in systems so that the ministry work together, health, agriculture, that they start to talk with each other. So that they, no, one pushes up, the other one down, no, no. So that everybody works and creates synergies and not these synergies like happening right now. It's too many of those things. So again, it, this means thinking in system, uh, having a good planning. We need plans, you know, not, not, not plans which you cannot change, but you need to know where you're going. If you don't change basically the, the point where you go, you always go back to the old place, right? That's what we do most of the time. So I think there are ways of visualizing for the policymakers as well as for the, the, the public, you know, those policies. And that's why you need multi-stakeholder dialogues Oh, we could be sitting here, the same group of people, and projecting policies right here. Mm. And then somebody says, oh, we could, the minister's here. I say, okay, how much money do you need? Different. And then you push the button, and you say, okay, that's my own scenario. And then we say, no, no, we need more money in agri-research and agroecology. What happens then? And you can actually see it right there. And so you can convince people. So these tools exist since the Club of Rome limit to growth. And this is the model we are using, basically, with many millions of dollars of, of improvements. But it can be done. Why are we not using those tools to help us think in system? Because the human brain can handle three variables at a time. This is for men. Women can do four. Five. <laughs> well, that's why they take care of the children, you know, because we keep forgetting them somewhere, right? But yeah. so, 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 just, so now, we, in the system, we tr work with up to 12,000 variables at the same time. And that's, we are overwhelmed by the complexity of the situation now. And that's why we need those tools to help us. And it can be done. So you excite people, you excite them with such tools. Thanks. Stu, so do you have anything to add? How do you convince policymakers in Ethiopia to embrace complexity and the holistic thinking? Well, you have a very good environmental protection authority. <laughs> <laughs> and especially the head of the... There's some So does that make it easy? <laughs> no, se seriously, actually. Oh, <coughs> look, if, if you look at, if you can compare UNEP with FAO, uh, UNICEF, the, the actual major UN agencies, UNEP, is actually a, a small child. Now, I hope what comes out of Rio is that uh, UNEP will become a full-fledged UN agency. This will make a lot of difference. But when ministers meet, it's not the environment minister that gets the big chair. Um, and uh, it's only... Um, <laughs> I know this from kind of uh, sideline experience and uh, stories, but you have to have very tough people. Now, when the United States set up its Environmental Protection Agency, it was incredibly progressive, very, very good. It came in with some of the best environmental safety legislation, and it has just been gradually reduced, 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 because you have this revolving door between big business and key se sectoral positions, like Anne Veneman. I remember Anne Veneman taking um, prime ministers of Africa to, to show the beauties of GM crops. And then uh, people like Museveni came back to Uganda and said, A, we have to get rid of all our smallholder farmers, and B, we have to do GM banana. Yeah, yeah. you know, this is... and. This is, the, this is the problem. It's, it's not a level playing field. It is not a level playing field. Um, so actually, for, for me, the most encouraging thing that's happening, not, not in Ethiopia, we've still got a long way to go. Rights, we can't even talk about rights at the moment. Um, uh, I'm a bit sour about that one. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but we... Um, this... Uh, Occupy Wall Street 
take over the stock exchange. Um, the uh, via one of the um, farmer movements that I have enormous respect for is Via Campesina. It's amazing what Via Campesina can do. Um, at Rio, they will mobilize. And actually, the best organized part, as I have seen it coming up for Rio, <coughs> is the People's Earth Summit. And it's being organized. And that, that actually, well, when, Rio, when Stockholm was launched in 1972, this is a little bit of history we learned the last two days, there was a hippie camp outside town. And, the, and there was a, a real scare that the hippies were going to invade. Well, now the hippies, actually, I was the, I'm the hippie generation. I'm still feeling quite hippie, although I never did some of those things. Um, but this is what we have to do. And these are our young people. And these are the ones we need to get on board, because these are the ones that are going to make the decisions. Us, I'm going to go under the ground quite soon, you know? And I don't mind about that. That's fine. I want to see p young people standing up. So environment clubs, getting people involved with nature, getting people really passionate, like so many of your members. And then do what we've done with the um, spreading out of the compost message. When we give a training, say it's 20 people, we have five local experts and 15 farmers. The end, we say, now if you like this and what we've done, go and train a minimum of 10 of your neighbors or family members. And it rolls out. Great. And this, this is the system. And the, my last message is that the world economy is structured into, the, 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 uh, apart from big corporate business, the other huge thing is the service industry the banks, the insurances. And everybody sits down and says, I want to be given a job. I want to be given a job. You know, I'm holding up my plate, I'm begging for a job. Now, listen, if you run an NGO, you don't get given a job. You have to actually work for every penny you put into your own salary and those of the people you work with you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Santa, you also work a lot with policymakers. Anything yeah. to add in this and, context? And the movement, <laughs> environmental movement. Uh, I, I really agree. We have to, to be angry. We have to mobilize so that they hear there is clear voice. And now it's perhaps too complicated. And we have to translate that complicated word in a more easy, easy way. Uh, and then some comments from others here. I think the price, was, of course, it will be uh, higher. It's why we have decrease the natural capital is, is going down. Uh, and uh, that's why the, the prices on the, on the food is so cheap. We, we are robbing just now, and that's why it's cheap. So of course it will be higher, but it's not a problem in the EU because we have so much money. We use more, less and less money for, for the foods, so it's not a problem. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing I think, how can we make the politicians more uh, engaged in this? I think we have to translate for example, the cap, the, this 430 billion. If we translate that into to, uh, teachers and other uh, railways, uh, what can we do? What can we do with this money if we don't use it in this direction? Then we get people angry. We have to tell them that we have so much money that we can use in another way, and we can get a better welfare. So we have to to talk. Um, from outside, I mean, also yet you mentioned the health problem it could be a very strong force into this agriculture discussion. Uh, and then the third one, I think we also have to <clears throat> really understand that uh, we say often in our organization that mobile phones production is not the same as you produce food. But if you go in a, in a normal economy education book, you, it's, it's no difference it, it, between mobile phones or if you produce uh, soya or whatever. So we have to understand that we can't handle this production as we did do with other things. And I think that's also a mission. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we have President, I just want yeah, to add yeah. some one more Go comment on. to I think it was Franco. Franco, you asked about extension, how we reach how we approach farmers. 
And I just, uh, you were talking about extension services, I believe. And I think this is one of the most difficult things uh, is to have people able to do extension work in agriculture or organic agriculture. It's because uh, it's, it's the most difficult work and it's, it's not evaluated as a work. And um, I don't know, I have the feeling that it, we live in a very funny w world, that it's, it's much more valuable to talk about something than to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that, that's true. And, and, and I think that like a, like a professor, and Joana perhaps has the same experience. If you, you write a nice paper about organic agriculture and you be able to publish in Nature or whatever, that's fine, you're gonna be very valuable. But if you go there and teach farmers how to do it, et etc., et it doesn't make any sense. And uh, I'm not saying that it's not important to publish, to write, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But to do this extension work, it, it, it's something very difficult. And, and I'm not talking about others, I'm talking about myself. After completing a PhD in a nice Ivy League school, I had to go to, to teach because it's very difficult, at least in my country, to survive do extension work. And that's something that I feel that I can do better, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, yeah, it's difficult to do this job. That's one of the things that it's not valuable to do. It's the, the extension work. And so this, this is, is, a, is a challenge. So let's see if we have like three more questions. We had one in the back, I know. It's, I guess it was you first, yeah? And two and three, yeah, and two, three. <laughs> that, and I guess that will be the three last questions. So try to keep it short because we're heading to the deadline of this seminar? Uh, we heard uh, really inspiring presentations. Uh, we have proofs that sustainable food systems uh, indeed are working. But uh, how we humans can change our mindset from linear thinking, as you said, to systemic thinking, when financial and economical forces controlling the direction of academic research and education I will give you funds for research if you produce me some cash flow. How how we can you deal with that? Thanks. And then yeah, um, curiosity. How 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 is vested interest discussed in these four I in FIO or in the meetings? Can you talk about it bluntly, or are you like excluded then? And and these people, as we have the vested, this is two part. How open can you talk about vested interest? And if we have the vested interest as this big, big thing in, the, in this area that is the problem, who is it that's not understanding what it is about? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last one down there. Gentleman in the back, please. Okay. Oh, okay. Works. Thank you, Smokey. Uh, I've had all the arguments here. My name is Kenneth, I come from Uganda. Uh, I'm a farmer, and I work with farmers for the last five years. The biggest, uh, the biggest incentive to a farmer is having a market for their produce. And the biggest problem we have in Africa is that our governments at farm organizations, which are mostly civil service, uh, civil service, uh, civil service organizations, as opponents rather than collaborators. Now, in my view, the only way, and, and they are very, and, and I, I, what you say, she said, when Seven came back from that tour, he, he came talking, Seven is my president, he came talking about to eliminating all smallholder farmers and promoting GMOs. But do you know what? The biggest problem is that these presidents and ministers and, and, and uh, civil society organizations who come to these meetings don't transmit this information back to the farm. And the farmers are nowhere in this forest prison for themselves. If you really want to make a change, you better start getting farmers and policy makers and scientists on the same table so that these discussions can benefit everyone. Otherwise, when the politicians get back home, they choose what to, to, to transmit back to the people, and they eliminate what is not happening. Start getting farmers 
on discussion tables. That is the only way you're going to get things done. Thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so we have a few questions. Anyone feeling? Johanna? Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, uh, yes, we ha we are really in a hurry, I think, and we haven't uh, got people. We have to make all consumers to to uh, to uh, um, oh no, I don't find the word. Um, really make sustainable choices in this in the uh, when they are buying their foods. And even if we have had information uh, 10 and 20 years about uh, organic food, only four percent of the customers buy organic. So we don't have the time to inform people that you should buy this and that to get uh, sustainable food. I think that when you enter the shop, you should thinking about I will have uh, good and cheap food. You will also you should also when you go out from the shop have the uh, 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 the food that are also the most sustainable. So we have to have the the um, all the groceries and all these. Uh, retailing sector, they have to help us. We have to focus and put a lot of effort to change and to learn and to inform them so that they, and, and also the, the poli uh, policy has to make this food that, the, the food is too cheap, but the, the um, sustainable food has to be cheaper and the not sustainable has to be more expensive. And also I think that schools are really important here to change our mindset I think that to go from linear mindset to holistic mindset, we have in Sweden we have something that is really unique. We have free public meals, and we don't use it. By by using them as pedagogic instrument in the education, they, we can learn the, um, the children about every part in life. We can learn them on ethical issues. We can learn about ecology. We can learn them about the local areas. We can learn them about history and everything. And we can also learn them to taste other um, kind of foods. And, and when they get to learn, they also learn their parents. So I think that that is really something that we have to start up right now. And we have to change this strange system of upanding where, where sure. communities are not allowed to buy local food. Uh, that is really important. Yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? We're running out of time. <laughs> Austria. Yeah, maybe just uh, you know, there was a touch on what uh, we're trying to do, you know, sort of how you change the, 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 sort of the way <coughs> we think from linear to, uh, the, to, to more system thinking. First of all, I think we should change the education system because actually, naturally, we humans think in system. It's just a school education system which actually removes this capacity because we want quick fixes. You know, we want uh, uh, a reductionist approach all the time. So you want to see, uh, do something, then something has to happen right away there, you know, where you expect it. Uh, so I think we have to go back and uh, into the schools. Um, that, that's that's important. And uh, for example, games. I mean, people play computer computer games all the time. Why not actually use proper systemic uh, uh, games? You know, so, uh, SimCity is something in that direction. But most of these games are actually really dumb, except uh, being intelligent. And uh, we tried actually to do a game which is on the web right now on Rio. It's called GameChangeRio.org. Uh, it's something which you can play, and the sixth best one will go to Rio to play it out there at the, at the final game. It's all based on the Green Economy Report and our the, the model system model behind it, which is running real data, real time. Uh, the first time that even active. So again, I think there are ways and tools out there we can use. Um, still, going back to the issue, you no, know, yeah, we have no time. We need to act. Now, that's why I said that, no, time to act is now. And what we need to do, it, we cannot avoid the issue of true pricing. I think if you say that we need to have the good food should be cheaper, which means that the bad food should be more expensive, and it will be so by the time you put in the externalities. It will be right there. So, so but where is the politicians got the courage to say, oh, now we're gonna do that. But again, no pain, no gain. And if you bring all the stakeholders together uh, in, in, in a dialogue, the farmers, the, the, the people, shopkeepers, the basically scientists, everybody in the society, and actually discuss this out, empower the people, I think it will change. But, but we cannot continue to have those like, fragmented discussions. I think we have to bring people together and show them you know, what the results of, of their action is. Okay, thanks. Svante, I guess you, we will now sort of lost. assume the last one. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the last reflection is I think we really have to, uh, to have a 
public awareness. Uh, I don't think people in the streets really understand the problem, either the option. Uh, many politicians in our parliament don't believe that we can feed the world with 100% eco, eco, agroecology. <clears throat> People in the street don't believe it either. Uh, this is the same situation that we had for some years, that they think that we need nuclear power plant. Don't, they don't really believe that now, I think. This time is over. We know that the wind and other, other alternatives is, is really a strong uh, alternative. But here we are far away from that situation. We have to really discuss it. Uh, over all newspapers and school education in the parliament and see that this is, this is science that can prove that it is possible. And we must do that first. And then we can change also the, the, the politicians' uh, regulations and decisions. And the other thing <clears throat> is also, I think it's a shame that in Sweden we haven't any professor in agroecology. Uh, it's really a shame. Uh, and we will focus on that in the long run and we will think we will win that fight uh, but we haven't, even in Sweden, uh, the type of education and, and professor, and I think let's say that we have a long way to go. <clears throat> then I will come back and thank you later. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Now we're running out of time, and uh, I just want to thank you all for listening and thank all the speakers. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a pleasure to discuss this with you. So. And then I will come in again. Then come in. <laughs> and thank you, Frederick. Thank you and to the audience. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, the audience, the speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Frederick has done an excellent, excellent, good job. So a special applause to him also. Swedish Society for Nature Conservation is very happy that you have been here today, and this is in just in one step. We will come back in this issue, and we will never get up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Would you see me here again?